namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambhutasa Udham Dhammam Sangham Namasami uh, Friends, we're uh, continuing our discussion about the practice of metta meditation, loving kindness meditation for the four persons. And now we've uh, come up to the uh, third person in this uh, system, which is the a neutral person. Uh, a neutral uh, feeling is uh, uh, given as uh, uh, neither pleasant nor unpleasant feeling. And it's uh, actually one of the most uh, precious uh, um, conditions or uh, dhammas that we should be able to experience as uh, Buddhists, both in our meditation and in our everyday life, that neutral feeling. Uh, the feeling associated with uh, like and dislike is a very uh, uh, short jump from the um, Vedana of a pleasant Vedana and an unpleasant Vedana, unpleasant feeling or pleasant feeling, then if the mind uh, uh, picks it up with liking and disliking, that would be uh, something which is um, uh, like an intentional formation or attitude or uh, inclination uh, towards these objects. So then um, uh, the objects that we dislike, uh, we would like to get rid of them or uh, get away from them. And the objects that we like, uh, we would like to get them, we would like to obtain them, or we would like to keep them. And so then uh, when pleasant and unpleasant is leading to like and dislike, then we're on the merry-go-round of samsara, uh, going uh, round and around with our emotional uh, merry-go-round here in this lifetime and also setting up the pattern which uh, leads to uh, going on and on with a different uh, life. So uh, actually the one thing that the human being or that the um, uh, a sentient being uh, likes to do, uh, they, they like to live, uh, they like to stay alive and they don't like uh, dying or being killed or uh, coming to the end of life. And so then uh, you have a lot of the uh, energy in the universe is involved with beings trying to live, trying to exist, trying to survive. Um, even when it seems like if you were perfectly objective and rational and you considered your uh, quality of life and um, uh, the advantages or disadvantages of living and dying, then uh, nevertheless, uh, um, the uh, more common uh, state is that people like to live. So they like, and then they, they uh, like uh, the factors that are uh, not just their survival, but a little bit above survival, like uh, safety and comfort. And then the, the people who are close to us in our universe who become our dear ones uh, at the mundane, ordinary level of an ordinary person or a child, somebody who's not had any training in the Dhamma, uh, they like the ones that they're close to, the ones that they see every day, uh, the ones who are uh, providing for them, providing for their safety and so forth. And then, um, um, Likewise, uh, 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 a disliking can be associated with what seems to be a threat 
or creating some kind of stress, some kind of danger. Um, and so then uh, these uh, neutral people, okay, so we don't know what they are to us or what they're going to be to us. We don't know if they will be um, a help to us or whether they will be a hindrance to us or whether it be a, a danger to us. Uh, probably this is something to do with a person's uh, formative uh, habits of the mind and uh, what kind of upbringing they had, what kind of culture they had, whether they um, see uh, some particular kind of person and assume that that person is probably uh, safe, probably a friend, probably somebody who can be trusted, or whether they assume that that, that person is uh, prob probably a danger, or probably someone to be avoided. Um, uh, but to the extent that we've developed um, a higher concept of what our welfare is, and not just being concerned about our uh, physical survival in this lifetime, uh, being aware of the effects of karma and uh, the uh, impact of our own actions on our future happiness, then we would um, uh, naturally uh, like to do meritorious deeds uh, that will accrue to our happiness in this lifetime and our happiness in the future. And we would uh, uh, dislike undertaking uh, unskillful, unwholesome, evil actions that is uh, likely to be uh, leading to uh, perpetuating uh, suffering and pain for us in this lifetime and continuing suffering and pain in the future. So then when we uh, come to have the ownership of our kama, then the qualities of the other people and the other beings that we encounter becomes not important. Not important to our comic survival. So if the monk is in the um, uh, jungle or the forest sitting at the foot of the tree and practicing meditation and they uh, feel um, a kind of like a warm body approaching them, uh, but they decide that um, they've got so much determination to continue meditation that they stay on their meditation object and they don't turn to look and see what that creature is. And then they, they feel uh, uh, a tongue um, licking uh, the sweat uh, from their head and um, can uh, perhaps uh, have a sense that it's a very large creature licking my head. And uh, then uh, if they have the um, uh, uh, determination about that this meditation is a merit leading to my liberation, leading to my happiness, and I've made a, a vow or a determination, I'm not going to give up this meditation no matter what. And then uh, uh, that monk could have the reflection, well, uh, this creature could kill me. And uh, if that's what happens, that will be the uh, karmic uh, result of some kind of a relationship that we had before. Um, but it, what will be, will be. And uh, if that's the fruit of my past karma, I accept it. Uh, but right at this minute, I'm not going to give up my meditation. Right. So even uh, that very large um, hungry creature, uh, which was um, uh, in, a, in the natural world, that would be someone that you would dislike. Uh, so they have the innate uh, characteristic that the average person would jump up and run away when they um, encounter that kind of a large and dangerous uh, uh, creature. But uh, the monk, and because of his, uh, his or her uh, mental development, is uh, neutral towards that being. And then they even would have the, have the attitude or the intention of non-harming 
towards that being. Um, have the uh, oh, potential for uh, uh, loving kindness towards that being. So a uh, neutral feeling, if you consider the neutral people are the people that when you see them, you uh, have a neutral feeling, then uh, uh, that would be um, actually um, a great opportunity for us to recognize that we have something that's a very uh, spacious, we have room for the wisdom factor to choose about what the uh, attitude is uh, towards uh, those individuals. Uh, so we can choose from a place of freedom to practice loving kindness for their person. Uh, we don't have to uh, resist the temptation to be attached to them as we would to a dear person. And we don't have to overcome the reaction of being aversive towards them as we would be towards a disliked uh, individual or a dangerous individual. Instead, um, nothing is pulling or pushing us. It's even possible that, and I don't know how it is for you, uh, uh, for myself, I have noticed that over the years and decades of practicing with this Dharma, that actually more and more people are in that neutral category. Uh, when I was a young um, woman, I um, very I regularly would uh, fall in love and be uh, very attached to uh, the partner or the person I was in love with. And so my whole world would be uh, divided into my, um, my primary partner in the first place and everybody else in the world in second place after the main person. Um, then uh, when I uh, undertook uh, the monastic form and uh, undertook to um, uh, uh, be celibate and not to be involved in that kind of a primary a relationship. And what happened to me for a few years was that I was so sensitive that whoever I saw, I would sort of fall in love with him. I was just really, the, the heart was like very open. The part of me which was attaching to my primary partner was just there um, and uh, willing to attach to um, anybody who came along. Uh, living in a monastery, quite a few people come uh, temporary. They come and stay for a few weeks or for um, uh, six months or for three months or for one year, and then uh, they move on and go somewhere else. And then it's a, a minority of the uh, uh, residents at a particular community who are staying there for many years and decades within one community. And then um, so in that way, having this uh, a capacity of loving in an attached way to who came along, then I also had the underbelly of grief and um, sadness or a little like a, some kind of a, a small like trauma when people would move on and go to the next thing. And then, uh, then more, uh, uh, in more recent years, it's kind of like whoever happens to be here, um, I would do my utmost to never hurt them, never harm them. I would have the attitude of kindness. I would be looking to see, okay, how can I help? Is there something I have to offer that would be helpful or beneficial for this individual? Um, but then if they go away, it, it's like, it doesn't really mean anything. So, so I, I don't know if it's because of uh, being in monastic form, being a long time practitioner of the Dhamma, or rather because of old age, uh, when you have, as years go by, there are more and more people that are in your past and fewer and fewer people in your future. Uh, so, so then um, actually I, 
I um, saw an interview of somebody who was extremely elderly. They were like 102 years old and everybody that they ever cared about had passed away. Um, and they were talking about how that changed their mind. Uh, so, so then uh, uh, the mind, which is equanimous towards beings, then actually the percentage of your universe, which is made up of neutral beings is uh, maybe larger uh, because of um, the mind uh, tending towards having that sort of equal minded um, feeling towards uh, towards uh, various uh, people and various beings. Um, so then this uh, practice of loving kindness for the uh, neutral uh, persons or sometimes translated as indifferent persons uh, is uh, got the potential strength of equanimity and it has uh, the potential weakness of apathy uh, so that um, rather than having the mind which is kind of like upright and mindful and having uh, this um, thought, uh, let me not do anything that's harmful or hurtful to this individual. Let me be aware of what they're about and uh, and what would what would be uh, uh, you know creating some hurt or some negativity that could have some bad impact on them or what would be beneficial, what would be helpful, and then having the the uh, uh, the mind. Uh, which is alert and has that uh, kind of like active intention, uh, that would be good, but it could also be the apathetic mind, which is just doesn't care. And so it's not arousing energy and is not observing closely, is not very aware of what's going on with people um, as, a, you know, sort of like, a, you know, withdrawn or disengaged in some kind of way. And um, this is um, it's natural to be disengaged from the great number of people outside of the circle of our close friends and our close enemies. Um, there's only so much room in the brain and there's only so many uh, minutes in the day. And if you were like very um, equally as uh, concerned about how all the people in the world who need food and how are they going to obtain food? Um, not to mention being concerned about how you yourself are going to obtain food. See, so you're willing to spend, you know, more than an hour in the day uh, organizing that you can get food, but you're not able to spend an hour for all of the other people in the whole wide world who need food. And even the mental um, attention, this is a criticism of the mental practice is that you, you're not actually able to um, specifically do that number of meritorious deeds to help that many people in the whole wide world. And uh, yet uh, in the practice of loving kindness for the indifferent people, uh, we see that those who are distant from us, indifferent, it's like it's a very large number of beings, incalculably large number of beings. And not only in this world system, but in the other world systems and thinking about the past and the future. And you can, can imagine uh, this uh, very large number of uh, persons that are outside of this small universe of those to whom we naturally have the uh, um, pleasant or unpleasant feelings. 
those those ones who are neutral to us and we can arouse the um, active mind which is has got the willingness it's the intention is the willingness for all of them without exception to be well and happy um, the willingness to consider the actions that I do or the things that I fail to do can have many, many ramifications uh, even uh, beyond what I'm immediately aware of. Uh, and uh, I don't want to be putting uh, negativity into the universe because uh, who knows how far it can go or who could be affected by negativity. So then that, that intention is, it's kind of like, it's an attitude, it's a, a readiness, it's a preparation. It would be like an underlying tendency towards kindness um, for the, the large number of beings in the world who are neutral to us. And then that tendency would then be activated to whatever uh, neutral persons or neutral individuals come into our domain. So then if you're walking on the street or riding a car, or riding a bus, and how many dozens or hundreds of people you could encounter uh, when you're out and about. And because of having cultivated that uh, uh, wide uh, uh, inclination of the mind towards kindness, then the energy comes up for uh, uh, a kind attitude towards uh, the individuals who we may not know very well, or the individuals that we may just encounter briefly, or the individuals that we may just encounter in some kind of a formal way, uh, like um, uh, the people in the neighborhood are, are like that. I mentioned in uh, passing that um, uh, if one recognizes the danger of uh, dullness or apathy in giving kindness to a, a neutral person, if you suppose you've chosen one uh, neutral person with a name and uh, practicing this uh, loving kindness meditation towards them. And uh, you may find that it's uh, different than practicing loving kindness for yourself or the dear person. Uh, you could find that it's more difficult to stick with the meditation for the entire meditation period because you're not so interested. You could find yourself getting sleepy. You could find yourself being bored or the mind, you know, somehow uh, resisting that meditation because um, you don't naturally want to take the effort to extend loving kindness to those, uh, to that neutral person. And um, if that's the case, if you have this um, uh, uh, potential uh, danger of apathy and you want to avoid it, then my uh, suggestion is that um, uh, before or while going into the practice of metta for neutral beings to do a preliminary contemplation on the theme of arousing energy. Um, there are several different ways that I could um, think of that are related to this. Uh, one is um, just uh, reflecting about spiritual urgency. It's called in Pali, it's called sang vega. And that uh, is uh, to say thinking uh, the teachings of the Blessed One are so valuable 
they, uh, I have uh, confidence that uh, these teachings are onward leading, that they will uh, uh, lead me to being uh, safe from uh, uh, being in an uh, unfortunate realm, being in a, a state of misery, and that they uh, can uh, lead me to liberation, that the heart can be uh, uh, liberated from uh, uh, craving, and the, the uh, wisdom factor can be uh, liberated from delusion, and that this thing is really possible, but uh, I just am able to make a choice about what to do in this lifetime. I don't know whether I'll have a chance in a future lifetime. So I need to really practice with sincerity to try to get as much as I can. Even, I don't know if, um, our, um, say, uh, the situation today is very comfortable for meditation. Perhaps we have a house to live in and uh, we are not yet senile, so we, the mind is still uh, capable of uh, focusing in meditation. Uh, we have uh, got enough to eat and uh, uh, we've had the chance to uh, hear some Dhamma teachings. All of these things could be turned upside down tomorrow. Uh, what if we had to spend the next uh, five years in a homeless shelter? It would be more difficult to practice the Dhamma in a circumstance like that. Or what if there were some kind of a, an illness or, or an injury that uh, we were uh, physically or medically very uh, impaired in dealing with a, uh, a much greater amount of uh, pain or a much uh, greater amount of uh, uh, injury that was uh, affecting our thinking ability. So we don't really know how much time we have. Uh, even we could lose our life uh, tomorrow or we could lose our life in the next breath or we could lose our life in um, two weeks or we could lose our life at any time. So uh, that kind of reflection then uh, can be energizing. Uh, I even uh, noticed that uh, it's interesting because of course like as a longtime Buddhist and as a bhikkhuni I've reflected about my uh, personal death, as well as reflecting about the death of everybody who I know. Uh, for many years, there's been this uh, reflection. And yet, uh, because of the recent uh, crisis with the uh, pandemic, uh, and being, you know, in the older age bracket, then uh, it becomes like a, so much more of a sure thing. So it's like, wow, it could, like it could for sure be in two weeks or one month uh, to uh, go from uh, sitting here giving Dhamma talks to being uh, in the uh, uh, emergency room and from there being in the grave or being uh, uh, into, uh, into another uh, uh, life uh, situation. And so it, it makes a shift in the energy when we know that death is coming and that we should use the time we have. Uh, another way of gaining energy is uh, actually uh, thinking about topics that are bright or topics that are inspiring. Uh, we um, uh, just uh, finished uh, doing the uh, loving kindness for the dear person. So, uh, for those of us who have a dear person who is uh, an accomplished uh, spiritual master or somebody who has, um, you know, those, those qualities of leadership who's so admirable, then uh, th thinking about the good qualities of our mentors and the good qualities of those who inspire us, that's something that can be an energizing factor. Or thinking about the good, beautiful qualities of the Buddha and thinking how you know, clever the Buddha was to have uh, come up with this uh, system, which is so uh, long lived and so beneficial to people in uh, coming from different circumstances. Uh, and so uh, uh, those kind of, uh, what we just call the bright meditation is a way of uh, bringing up energy or if you feel, uh, you know, like you have the sunken mind sinking into dullness uh, coming out of that. Um, the, uh, 
uh, there's a phrase in uh, Pali that is very uh, dear to me uh, that I use when I'm thinking of stirring up energy. It's a refrain um, that happens in uh, terms of um, the um, a right effort in the Noble Eightfold Path and also in terms of the four powers. Uh, the phrase in Pali is, it goes, um, Chandang jane tivayamati viryang arabati chitang paganhati parahati. And um, what it means is uh, the chandang janeti is to arouse the wish or the desire. So it's like if you were um, uh, sitting at home and you have um, a lot of a list of um, potential things that you can be about as your activities for the day. And um, somehow or other, uh, because of your own thinking process or because of the uh, circumstance of the day, uh, you have this clarity say, this is the thing that I want to do today. You know, today I want to mow the lawn. Uh, today I want to uh, sort the library. Today I want to uh, practice uh, meditation at a, at a higher level. And so uh, there was some kind of a, like a moment of decision, that moment of arousing something. So that's one kind of energy. So then I think about what that um, moment of decision is like in all kinds of natural circumstances, like, um, you know, deciding to mow the lawn or deciding to um, uh, do something and how that feels, how it is in the body, what's happened in the mind when it was like a different part of the brain got activated and says, yes, I'm going to do this. And then take that same movement of the mind and turn it to the meditation. I decided to practice metta. This is my decision. Uh, so that's chanam janeti. And then uh, vayamati is uh, 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 stirring up uh, uh, the, um, the, the power. So you could say that uh, chanam janeti would be like you turn the ignition in the car, and Ryamati is you step on the gas. So that's that's what makes it go. So if you just are sitting on your cushion and say you decide to mow the lawn, but you didn't get up, then you wouldn't actually mow the lawn. That that decision is sort of like in vain and almost becomes like a kind of a sickness if you make decisions and then nothing is aroused to do something with it. So then I think when we get up and go and put it into action. What's that like? How does that feel? Um, so that's like a second part of, um, of uh, uh, arousing energy. And then, and then the, the third uh, part um, is called uh, viryam arabati. So the virya, which is the Pali for um, effort, it also has a meaning uh, say virya and hiria, it's heroic. So it's like valiant. Um, it's like virile. So bring up your manly strength. And so at this point, you are like arousing the super strength to go beyond what you've done before to go beyond the average everyday level and to really give it a push, to really push through. So that's the, that's the um, Viryang Arabati. So it's uh, uh, stirring up a heroic energy. Uh, the metaphor I give for that is um, uh, people who undertake a large project that really taxes them and draws on all they're able to do. And I especially respect uh, parents 
because I believe that parenthood really tests you to the ultimate. And maybe even, I mean, it was so difficult for mom to have the baby in the first place, uh, but then uh, how much strength, how much persistence, how much it was uh, that child has pulled out of you a reserve of, of uh, love and determination and caring that was uh, something that maybe as a younger person, you didn't even know that you could care so much. And so that's, that's what the uh, third um, aspect of uh, arousing energy. And then um, uh, the last one is, uh, it's really two, it's a uh, uh, chiktan paganhati, which is um, you uh, take hold of the mind. Um, uh, there's the Christian hymn, uh, lift up your heart. So you lift up your mind, or you could say you get a grip on your mind. And so if you have turned the ignition and you stepped on the gas and then you really floor it, um, you've got to be steering. So you have to be um, uh, hanging on to the car. You have to be like in control of the car while you're going. And so it's an aspect of stirring up energy that then the energy is controlled and directed and guided and um, aimed in the right way. And so that uh, taking hold of the mind is then being able to aim the energy in the skillful way to be going towards the destination. And then um, the last part is uh, parahati, which means to uh, strive um, er, uh, I have a phony etymology for that because a para means a foot. And I was a long distance hiker. And I think of the parahati as uh, the energy of hiking, which is that you keep putting one foot in front of the other and then you don't stop until you get there. So the parahati is you keep going. You keep going and you don't stop until you reach the destination. So if you've turned the ignition, stepped on the gas, floored it, uh, steering, and you want to get from um, Roner Park to uh, New York, then you keep going until you reach New York. You don't stop in Chicago. You go, keep going, go all the way. That's the meaning of the Parahati. So uh, then um, in uh, doing this, uh, trying to do this, uh, Meta meditation for a uh, indifferent person or a neutral person. And that one neutral person that you have chosen is kind of like a representative of the maybe thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of other people who are also perhaps a neutral to you because you don't know anything about them. Um, that uh, uh, what you want to do is develop that practice to the complete full level of metta meditation practice, the same uh, degree of uh, kindness, uh, sympathetic joy, compassion, and equanimity, uh, all of the factors of the Brahma Viharas you want to bring to bear on that neutral person uh, uh, to the full extent and you're going to really be clear that you're going to give it a full effort um, and that may help to um, uh, enable you to uh, practice uh, uh, with that and not to fail. Now it's also true that for some people uh, it could be that because of different um, hindrances or um, psychological formations that you feel uh, it's difficult to give kindness to yourself. It's difficult to give kindness to your close and dear ones, but it's easy to give kindness to people who are neutral. And so, well, that's okay. If, um, if that is what uh, works for you, then just uh, uh, use it. And uh, um, as in um, all the aspects of this path, we see that the the Buddha is, 
showing us the way to take uh, inclination of the human being, which is completely natural, completely normal, and to take what we already have and build up from there and bring it to a more refined, more intentional, and more properly uh, directed way so that then it becomes a, a stepping stone to the uh, further um, uh, development of our own of our own uh, bhavana, our own uh, cultivation of the mind and heart, which is uh, 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 leading to the uh, release from uh, craving and uh, creating the uh, uh, space for the opening up of wisdom. <laughs>